Good day. We're going to talk about volumes and calculus today, continuing our discussion about volumes in calculus. We're not going to revolve any region around any axis today. We're building volumes in a different way. Let me show you immediately what I'm talking about. We have pictures like this. Now these are all three-dimensional regions that are built with theoretically an infinite number of flat regions. So you're looking at this shape, this first shape, and you'll notice that I have y equals x squared and the x-axis. This region is being built upon the foundation of the area between the graph of y equals x squared and the x-axis. In fact, all of these pictures are being built on that same region. That's what they all have in common. All of these have in common the foundation of the area between the graph of y equals x squared and the x-axis. The difference is the cross sections are different shapes. In this first shape, I'm looking at bookshelving a bunch of semicircles with area formula 1 half pi r squared. In the second picture, I'm looking at bookshelving a bunch of squares with area formula side squared. In the third picture, I'm looking at bookshelving a bunch of rectangles having area formula base times height. And in the fourth picture, I'm looking at bookshelving a bunch of equilateral triangles. The area formula for a triangle is one-half base times height. So what we're going to have to do is figure out what the picture looks like, how to figure out a side length of the figure we're talking about, and then utilize an area formula and integration to figure out these volumes. So kind of a helpful picture here. If you blur your eyes, you can see the three-dimensional region that is formed in each case. Uh, so we're going to book kind of quickly here. And so if you're watching the film and you're going, whoa, too fast for me, uh, I kind of expect that. So you'll have to pause or rewind a little bit in order to catch uh, the details of what we're talking about. So um, let's get cracking right away. We'll give you one example with this film and then a second example following. So the words here kind of set up everything you need to know. As I read this, it says the base of a solid is the region enclosed by the graph of y equals root 25 minus x squared and the x-axis. The cross sections we're going to utilize this time are the shapes we're going to build onto that foundation are going to run perpendicular to the x-axis and they're going to be squares. So the first thing I'm going to show you is that y equals root 25 minus x squared. Maybe you know what that equation is going to provide for us. The hint is think of that as uh, x squared plus y squared equals 25. If I gave you that equation, you'd say, oh, that's, uh, that's just a circle with radius 5 centered at 0, 0. Well, the fact that we're solving for y here, you realize you'll have a plus or minus scenario. We're only going to graph the plus side. So all we're going to graph here is a circle with its positive half. All right, so I'm just going to, and you guys have been down this road before, make an xy coordinate grid going five units right and left and five units up. Again, I don't have to worry about going five units down as we are only going to graph the upper half of this circle. And then I have y equals root 25 minus x squared. I realize that is an upper half of a circle with radius five. Boom, there it is. Now the real challenge is drawing this same picture in three dimensions, not on an XY coordinate grid, but on an XYZ coordinate space. I want to draw this nice and slowly for you so you get a feel for what you need to do on your end. But since we are going to build cross sections that are perpendicular to the X axis, those words right there are semi-important. 
that we need to realize that the x-axis needs to be horizontal. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw a horizontal axis and then the y-axis which will have some Detroit lean to it so that our picture has some perspective. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is make these hash marks. Five to the right, five to the left where if I extended those hash marks they would run parallel to the y-axis. I realize to the right is positive 5 to the left is negative 5. This is positive 5 on the y-axis. Now the semicircle that you see on the left is now being drawn on this xyz coordinate space. Now you might be yelling at the screen right now, oh, where's the z-axis? I don't see the z-axis. We'll put the z-axis on here in a moment. That will be an important issue. So um, right now, all we've done is we've taken the uh, xy coordinate grid and redrawn it so that we can com accommodate an xyz coordinate space. At this time, since we're going to draw cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis, I'm drawing these little gray lines that will be guidelines for me when I draw my picture. And going straight up and down, and that's important, is the z-axis that you were waiting for earlier. So now we're going to begin building these squares. So I'm going to use the guidelines. I'm going to start from right and work to the left. Here's the first square. I go right over the guideline. Now I'm drawing lines that are parallel to the z-axis, and then connect. So if you're looking at that, maybe you're getting visual, and you can see that we've really drawn a square in perspective. When you draw in, pers in perspective, squares aren't going to look like squares. Uh, but if you can visualize in perspective, things will make sense to you. So there's the first square. Here comes the second square. Again, use the guidelines. Now go straight up parallel to the z-axis. Straight up parallel to the z-axis and connect. Yeah, question for you. Are, are all the squares supposed to be the same size? No. The squares' sizes are dictated by that blue line, by that semicircle. So as I move to the left here, my squares are getting larger and larger. Here comes the third square. The guideline. Then straight up north and south parallel to the z-axis and connect the fourth square use the guideline straight up parallel to the z-axis now things are going to begin tapering down again so we go from small to large you can see the largest square that's going to exist and now we're going to taper back down small again. I haven't drawn the entire picture. We've just drawn one, two, three, four, five squares so you guys kind of see a picture of what's going on here. And the math associated with this, as you might guess, is we're going to bookshelf these squares uh, from negative five to five and add up an theoretically infinite number of these squares in order to find the volume of this shape created by that uh, foundation of a semicircular base. <whistles> Lots going on. So here, we'll bump up the speed here a little bit, um, is the integral that you will use. We're going to integrate from negative 5 to 5 some area formula written in terms of x dx. I know the area formula for a square. The area formula for a square is take some side and square it. Well, for this particular square, hold the phone here. I'll back up the shop, sorry. For this particular square, a side, one side of the square will be equal to root 25 minus x squared minus 0. That's essentially the blue curve minus the x-axis. That's essentially top curve minus bottom curve. So one side of the square is root 25 minus x squared. 
the area formula for a square is take any side length and square it. I know the side length is 25 minus x squared all underneath the square root sign. So at this time, I'm going to integrate from negative 5 to 5 the square root of 25 minus x squared. And then I have to remember that's the side length. i got to square that cat with a dx. You can see how user-friendly this is. You know what's going to happen when I square that square root. Things are going to get simpler, not more difficult. So the rewrite becomes integrate from negative 5 to 5. Again, the square eliminates the square root. I'm just left with 25 minus x squared dx. Now I ought to be able to successfully integrate that using the power rule in reverse. That's going to lend me to uh, 25x minus x cubed over 3. And we're going to evaluate that from negative 5 to 5. So I'm using FTC1 at this time. I'm plugging in a 5 for x and getting 125 minus a 5 in for x. 5 cubed is 5 times 5 times 5. That's also 125 over 3. Close that quantity and then subtract using FTC1. I now plug in the lower limit of negative 5. 25 times negative 5 yields negative 125. And then I'm going to cube negative 5. Negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5 is negative 125. Since I'm subtracting that negative, it yields uh, 125 over 3. Close it. Well, I'm going to do this math here by hand uh, and realize that uh, 125 plus 125 I'm talking about sorry this 125 and subtract negative 125 that's what gives me 250 and then um, by the same token I have negative 125 over 3 minus another 125 over 3 it's going to give you minus 250 over 3. So getting common denominators here, I have 750 over 3 minus 250 over 3, which lands me on 500 over 3, or 166 and 2 thirds units cubed for the volume of this shape, which is a bunch of squares added up from negative 5 to 5, with size dictated by the curve root 25 minus x squared. Hope that makes sense to you. The second example I'm going to show you is a touch more complicated, uh, but these are volumes of cross sections, and that is example one. Stay tuned for example two.